Good morning. I was just telling Kirk, I'm not sure why we do the lesson over here and we lead singing over there, but that's not a tradition I'm going to break. Uh, before we get started, I do want to bring greetings from uh, Umberto. Sent a message, just said to give the church greetings and let you know that they're praying for us all. I know we're doing the same for them. So, greetings from Cuba. And then I'll also start with a disclaimer before we get any further into Isaiah. Isaiah is a book of prophecy. And so, what's written in the book is what's written in the book. Um, I will give you some things that are my interpretations and. There are some things that I don't think we will ever fully understand in our lifetime. Um, if you look at some of the prophecies leading up to Jesus, when Jesus came and those prophecies were for fulfilled, God's people didn't even know at the time that the prophecy was being fulfilled. And so I uh, just wanted to give that disclaimer, especially as we get into chapter 2, the first few verses. Um, so we'll start with that. Isaiah chapter 2, starting with verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the nations and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So the first few verses of Isaiah chapter 2 parallel to the first few verses of Micah chapter 4. I think that's mentioned in our book too. Um, it's, it's almost word for word, the exact same uh, text for those first few verses. And so both contexts use the same words. Um, my translation didn't have the word, but it says the word that Isaiah saw um, in other translations and in the original text. Um, so both of those use the word, and that's not the same uh, meaning or context as the word that's used in John chapter 1 when it talks about logos being the word of God. So the word that's used here simply means the matter or the thing. So the matter or the thing that both Isaiah and Micah saw um, is what, are, what they're talking about here. And it, sa it says they both saw something. It uses the word hazah. And so that's not saw as in I visibly saw physically with my eyes as in, as in I, how I see you all today. Um, that word is uh, as in a vision. So they saw as in a vision um, both, both Isaiah and Micah. So there are plenty of commentaries that would say that one of the prophets probably copied from the other. And there's a lot of discussion on which one copied from which. And so I just wanted to point out and let that be our first topic of conversation. Um, I don't agree with that, that either one of them copied from the other. Um, and I'll give you my position on that. So both, both of the prophets started their writing by saying they had a vision from God. And so that by itself is enough for me to say they didn't copy from each other. Both had a vision, um, a vision separate and apart from each other. The whole chapters, the whole text is not exactly the same. It's one little uh, piece of the passage. Um, but this whole concept of did one copy from the other and debate over that kind of reminds me of what we call red-letter Christians, people that believe what Jesus said but don't believe the rest of the Bible. And so um, that's kind of how I look at this is the Bible says they both saw a vision then they both saw a vision. There wasn't any copying from one to the other. Um, they couldn't have both seen a vision and copied at the same time. Micah was a prophet in Judah at the same time as Isaiah, um, but that doesn't mean that they colluded or, or copied off of each other for the same text. Um, if we think about it logically, God has a message for his people, and I think it's logical to think that that message is the same regardless of which prophet it comes through. Um, I think of, at work right now we've got a, a big debate going on on how to solve a problem, and so I've been talking to a lot of people 
about how I think we should solve the problem. And so if you asked any of those two people what I told you, they're probably going to tell you the exact same words because I've been saying the exact same words. And I think that's what God's doing here. That's true. So to me, with these two passages being almost word for word the same, uh, that just emphasizes the importance of the passage. And so that's what I want us to look at today, um, just starting out with 1 through 5. So it talks about in the last days. So we're talking about the time leading up to the end of earth. Um, Are they talking about the last few literal days? Are they talking about the last few years, the last few decades, centuries? I don't know. Maybe you have your opinion. John, you have an opinion? I believe it's talking about the coming of Christ here. And the last days are what we're told that in the last days, Joel says, and it's quoted in in Acts, the second chapter, that those were the last days. And so I think it's referring to the coming of Jesus here. Second coming or first coming? First coming. Okay. Um. So then it says the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. And so seemingly this is referring to Mount Moriah, which is where Solomon built the temple, where Abraham bought, um, Abraham went to bring his son as an offering, a sacrifice. Um, So there is the interpretation that it's talking about physically the mount, um, the mountain of the Lord being at Jerusalem because it goes in and talks about Zion. It talks about Jerusalem. Uh, there is another interpretation that it could be figurative speak, um, meaning the mountain of the Lord's temple is Christ's church now that Christ has come. Um, and then, of course, Christ's church is built upon the house of Jacob and the God of Jacob. So there are two interpretations. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. I don't know. Um, I think either one of them makes sense to me. And it says the law will go out from Zion. So what is Zion? city of David or city of God um, and can be can be meant to be the city of God not necessarily a physical place um, but there was a physical Zion Mount Zion um, which was one of the the or was the eastern most of the two hills in Jerusalem so there again both interpretations both literal or figurative I think would make sense it says the word of the Lord was from Jerusalem And the word that they're using here is different than the word at the very beginning of the chapter. Um, The word here simply means the decree of the Lord, what the Lord says. And it says that it will come from Jerusalem. And again, that can be taken both literally or figuratively. If if you're looking at the word of the Lord coming from Jerusalem Jerusalem physically, that is where Christ uh, or where God's people were. Um, but if you're looking at it as in the Christ church, the word of the Lord did originate. The Old Testament originated from God's people um, who were in Israel and Jerusalem. So it says he will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many people. Nation will not take up sword against nation and they will train for war no more. So that's the one that kind of makes you wonder exactly where they're talking about because I don't know a time in our history where we haven't had war um, nation rising up against nation if you look in Matthew chapter 24 Jesus talks about um, the end times and one of the things that he says in there is that nation will rise up against nation Um, so are those two things contradictory in these two passages no what makes them not contradictory
Okay. Revelation chapter 20. Yep, that's where I was going next. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Um, it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand the, a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and locked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had uh, been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So here's another parallel to what Isaiah is talking about um, and what Jesus was talking about. I don't know if Jesus was referring to nation rising against nation before uh, that period or after that period where it talks about Satan coming back and gathering his armies. Um, but that is one, one thing that we could look at and say what that could be. Um, Isaiah chapter 2 and Revelation 20 seem to line up and be talking about the same period of time, but we don't know that. Um, And it says, uh, moving on, it says, Isaiah, Isaiah says that those living at the time that he's talking about will say, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Um, so let's read on in Isaiah, the next, the rest of the chapter. Go ahead. I presume would be at the end of the thousand years that it's talking about well, it, potentially talking about, uh, or at that particular time. <laughs> um, so we'll read on in Isaiah chapter two. We'll go ahead and read the rest of the chapter starting in verse six. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. 
So man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide into the grounds, fear, hide in the ground from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that, ex for all that is exalted and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every uh, stately vessel, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Men will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from, the dread, from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, men will throw away, throw away to the rodents and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. They will flee to caverns in the rocks and go into the overhanging cracks from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? And so this next part of Isaiah goes on and it's talking about the state of God's people and the state of the world um, whenever this happens. And this is one that I, I think that he's kind of talking about the, the end of times leading up to the second coming. Um, but we can talk about that if you want to. Um, it says there's no end to their treasures, there's no end to their chariots or armies. They bow down to the work of their hands, the idols, um, things that people make in place of God. And so in our time, that wouldn't necessarily be just the idols that they had back in those days. It could be things like computers and money and any other thing that we have today that we put in front of God. Um, and then chapter 3 even talks about everything being taken from Jerusalem and Judah because of their sin. So taken away from God's people because of their sin. Specifically uh, in verses 8 and 9, it says, Jerusalem staggers, Jer Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. They look on their face, the look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. And so I'll point that verse out. We're, it skips ahead next week to chapter 5, so we don't go over chapter 3 and 4. So I wanted to bring that one in and, and just point out we're living in a world of sin where sin is paraded like it was in the days of Sodom. All you've got to do is turn on TV for a few minutes and pick any given sin, and it's paraded in front of us as, as if it's part of life and it's no big deal. Um, so that's... I'm not saying that the prophecy is talking about right now. I'm just saying that I'm, there's a parallel. The primary, the primary, there are at least two times this happened, though, to Judah and Jerusalem. It happened in the Babylonian conquest. They took everything from there. They took everything from the land. And then at, in 70 AD, after Jesus had come and they had rejected him, the Romans did the very same thing and basically scraped it bare so that it couldn't be couldn't be inhabited. In fact, they thought that it could not. Jew, no Jew could be in Jerusalem for centuries, really, after that. And so there were two physical fulfillments of, of this. Right. Not saying that there's not a third and an ultimate one, but, but there were two. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so back to Isaiah 2, he talks about the lofty, the arrogant, uh, and the proud being humbled. He goes through uh, examples of the things that pe make people or mankind proud. He talks about the natural resources, uh, talking about the trees. He talks about uh, anything that man may boast about. Um, so that could be uh, towers, fortified walls. Uh, and, and it kind of remind, reminded me as I was studying, again, I'm not saying this is the prophecy and what it's talking about, but just to kind of get, get your mind of how it's going to be in that day if, when that happens. Um, 
the destruction of the Twin Towers, the sinking of the Titanic, things that are man-made, that man thinks are wonderful and excellent, uh, are things that in, in the end are not anything that's important to God. And so if you just think about that, in the day of the Lord, the arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. Um, so those things that man thinks are wonderful and great, God is going to humble us uh, and show us that they're not. Um, and then it goes through and talks about fleeing to caves and to rocks. So things that are leaving things that are man-made, houses, um, whatever it is, and going into things that are God-made on the earth, caves, rocks, hiding places. Um, I think all of that is part of humbling those uh, humbling us as mankind to remind us that God is the one that's in control. All right, so the last verse uh, is instruction, I think, that we can always take heart in our lives. Stop trusting in man of what account is he. So the creator of the Titanic, the creator of the Twin Towers, the creator of anything man-made, all of those people were born and died. Um, the first man to walk on the moon was born and died. Jesus was born, died, and resurrected. And so our Lord lives forever. Uh, he is the one that's in control, and that's the one that we should focus on and not on the things of man. God's blessed us with the intelligence to build these things and to do all these great things, but sometimes I think we let that intelligence come between us and him. Um, and sometimes we just got to step back and remember where we got that intelligence and who's in control. And it is not a new thing. The Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. they raised it and they, they were so proud of it that we're going to reach the heavens with this. And Right. Right. That's what makes some of these prophecies so hard to grasp, I think, is we don't know when, if they've already happened, or if they're going to happen again. And, you know, that, it makes it hard to grasp, grasp sometimes. That's right. <laughs> we saw that with the Israelites throughout the Old Testament, can, over and over again. Right. So going along with that, um, stop trusting in man. I just want to end us with Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. And if there's any other discussion, we can do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be, will be filled to overflowing and your vats will, be will brim over with new wine. So that's what I've got for the lesson this morning. Does anybody have any discussion before we close? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning uh, after having the opportunity to study your word together. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for all of those who were able to gather here and online, Lord, to study your word uh, and learn from it. We pray that you will continue to be with those that are in Cuba, Lord. We pray that you will bless our brothers and sisters down there and all the trials that they face each and every day. We just lift them up to you and ask that you be with them. Lord, as we go into this hour of worship, we pray, pray that you will help us to prepare our hearts to come before you in worship and forget about all the things of this world. In Christ's name, amen.